to to be part of this symposium. I, I, my main regret is I haven't been able to attend very much of the rest of it for too many other things happening today. But um, what I've heard has been very interesting. And uh, I appreciate that I'm the last one in a in a in a whole series of talks and also that I don't know how many people are in India, but if you are there, it, it is now the evening time. And so uh, I've tried to keep this fairly sort of um, maths light and entertainment rich. So <laughs> that, that may or may not come across, but uh, but hopefully you can just sort of sit back and uh, don't have to engage brain too much. Um, uh, I'm, it's also sort of slightly. Uh, I was wondering what what to speak of in the in the, in the theme of this symposium. Um, and I thought about talking about some some sort of more conventional stability problems, uh, but in the end, I thought this maybe I'd, I'd speak about this, where the instability is kind of is kind of the dominant physics. Actually, the whole thing is wildly unstable, um, and in some sense, what, what we're trying to do in terms of modeling is is capture average behavior. That is, the the instability is kind of giving rather chaotic small scale structures doing interesting things, and and the question is really, can you understand some average? mean behavior associated with that so um that's sort of my background introduction the the the, the talk is about convection in porous media uh, and particularly i'm motivated by trying to understand uh what impact heterogeneity that is um different porous structure has on flow in porous media uh, and there's lots of people have thought about this and there's lots of different ways you can think about this of course, the, as soon as you start to raise the spectre of heterogeneity, you realize there are an infinite possibility of ways that, that a porous medium can be heterogeneous or anisotropic or whatever. And so the, the, the challenge then is, you know, how do you learn anything at all rather than just saying, oh, well, it's just it's just a sort of random pore structure. Um, well, it turns out that there is one quite common form of heterogeneity, which is horizontal layering or roughly horizontal layering. It, and this is in geological settings anyway the the um most porous rock that you're interested in describing flow through is sedimentary it was formed by being by sort of deposits over time and it's quite common that you get um uh due to the geologic makeup of aquifers of these things that you get these kind of uh, thin layers of, of much less permeable material that, that intersperse uh, say sandstones or limestones so often they might be something like a, the, there was a landslide or something which lay down a, a load of clay or, or shale or something which then it becomes like an Im, Im, almost impermeable barrier so here's for example this is on the south coast of england there's a there's a sandstone rock which is exposed and has you can you can sort of make out i mean it's all quite eroded eroded but you can see there is some sort of um fairly regular uh um sort of much less much more well it's hard to tell just by looking at it but but clearly different layers that intersperse this medium in fact these are much lower permeability than the than the kind of host medium that they're that they're in and this this exposed cliff face actually is an interesting rock formation it it, it gradually slopes down underground and if you travel about 10 miles uh, east of where this picture is taken th this whole rock formation is then about a kilometer underground and in fact is an aquifer with with oil in so um, this is a sort of relevant example. Um, most of what I'm talking here is going to be based on numerical simulations and then some sort of theory to try and understand what's going on. There's a there's a movie I'm going to motivate this with a numerical simulation movie, which is actually not quite what I'm going to talk about, but it's fairly similar. And this shows um, what happens if a plume, a dense plume, falls through a medium that has this kind of layering. So, um, ooh, yeah, here we are. So here we are. I hope you can see there's a movie in the bottom left there. Uh, I haven't marked on where the layers are in the porous medium, but it's pretty obvious because you see that the the, the dense mixture, the, the, which is just colored red and yellow here, um, sinks and spreads over the layers because it's hard to get across them. But it that does then go across them. And as it crosses them, it becomes unstable. You can see the sort of fingering instabilities at each layer which form. And you get this interesting kind of fountain like effect with a series of layers. Uh, with interesting different dynamics going on at each layer, and this, you know, would go on, and you could ask, and how how much is this dispersing the plume, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that is something I have thought about and done, uh, but I, I'm not actually going to talk about plumes here. I'm going to talk about the same problem, but where the the source is a dispersed source, so the whole there's a whole upper boundary which is dense rather than just an isolated point. The reason I'm doing that, uh, I don't want to 
labor the I don't want to talk too much about uh, the sort of background physics here. Um, and many of you will know something of this problem. Uh, and in fact, it's slightly sort of gone off the boil in terms of global interest compared with 10 or 15 years ago. But there's still hope, I think, that, that this could take off. That, that This is the idea of carbon dioxide sequestration, storing CO2 underground. Uh, and the, the basic idea is you pump pressurized carbon dioxide down into an aquifer, an aquifer full of water, uh, which is just rock. Uh, and the CO2 will spread, and crucially, you want to avoid it being released back into the atmosphere. CO2 is buoyant compared to water, so it will rise a bit like shown in this picture. It will rise through the aquifer and spread. But of course, uh, it also has uh, the property that it dissolves. It's weakly soluble in water, and the solution that's formed is dense. So you get this interesting effect of CO2 rises because it would rather be above the water. But actually, at the interface, you build up this dense mixture, which then can become unstable to convection and sink. And lots and lots of people have thought about various things to do with this problem. The basic instability problem, which is, you know, the, uh, a thin layer growing of dense CO2 solution. When does it go unstable and what's the nature of that instability? That's a very interesting problem. Uh, mathematically very interesting because it has an evolving base state. Lots of people have thought about it. I'm not going to talk about that here. But I am going to talk about what happens in, in the sort of longer term when you have this convection happening. What if there are layers in the aquifer? What do they do? So that it summarized there in the bottom, I, I'm going to try to cover quite quickly uh, what happens if there are no layers, just so you know the background story. That's what I'm calling one sided homogeneous convection. And then I'm going to talk about what happens if there are layers. So uh, just to sort of give you the the um, modeling snapshot, that everything's going to be two dimensional uh, just for ease of everything. Uh, and the picture is broadly as shown there in that in the in this um, schematic. There's a box which has a no flux boundary on uh, three sides. Uh, that's the two sides in the bottom. And on the upper boundary, there is some imposed concentration. And the interior is initially at some much lower concentration, say zero. So suppose the imposed concentration is one, the interior is zero. And the concentration is linked to the buoyancy by an equation I'll give you in a minute, which means that this is actually a dense source on the upper boundary. So convection, so uh, sorry, uh, solute, this concentration of whatever solute you're trying to describe, Will will diffuse into the into the domain, and then you'd expect will become unstable to convection and sink. And the thing you maybe really care about is what is this F, the flux, the the buoyancy flux or the the convective flux, if you like, of concentration through the upper boundary, and how does that evolve over time? Uh, so that that's that's the sort of basic picture. Uh, let me just quickly show you the the equations. Uh, I'm not going to get too too sort of. Uh, sucked into the details of these, but it's important that you're on the same page with what I'm actually modeling. So, so we're going to take incompressible flow. U here is the Darcy velocity. So it's, uh, as has been mentioned in previous talks, that the uh, this is, satisfies Darcy's law, which is just the equation for flow in a porous medium at a macroscopic scale. Um, it, it links the, the flow to uh, linearly to gradients in the pressure, where there's here a permeability, and the permeability will become an important thing when I think about layering. Uh, and then the, the density appears there as well, the buoyancy term. The concentration uh, advex and diffuses with some effective diffusivity. I'm not considering any kind of velocity dependent dispersion here. This is just a, a constant diffusivity. And then finally, the concentration is linked back into the density in Darcy's law by an equation of state, which I'm going to claim is linear here. And you can you can simplify this problem by non-dimensionalizing. And in fact, there's a nice way of non-dimensionalizing this if you choose sensible um, scale there's a natural buoyancy scale for the problem which just comes out of looking at a balance in Darcy's law and then there's a natural uh, advection diffusion length scale which comes out of looking at the transport equation and if you use that to non-dimensionalize your length instead of what you might think of which the most natural scale you, you could think of would be the, the imposed height of the domain h star but instead if you use this uh, z as I've called it down here you end up with a a set of a uh, equations that is parameter free. So there's no parameters in your dimensionless. This is now all dimensionless. There are no parameters left in the model apart from in the geometry. So the actual domain depth becomes this, what I'm calling H, uh, which is this grouping here, which if you're used to any kind of convection problems, you'll recognize as, as a Rayleigh number. So it's a slightly weird way to do it, but but in some sense, I've, I've put the Rayleigh number into, a, into the, a geometrical feature. It's now It's now the effective depth of the domain and the equations themselves are, are parameter free. Okay, that, that's that's what we're going to do.
So uh, without further ado, let me just quickly show you a, a simulation result in a homogeneous medium. So there's no layers here. This is just a, a uniform porous medium. Uh, unfortunately, for historical reasons, this movie doesn't start with the initial condition. It starts after some time. So you can see at the point that it starts here, the color is showing concentration. Um, there are already it's already very unstable. It's been, there's clearly some sort of instability. There's a thin layer you can't even see on this scale of, of convection of um, concentration that's built up by diffusion at the top which became unstable to these fingers, which have already started to coarsen and merge at this point, and I'm going to run it on from here. I'm also going to show on the right here the horizontally averaged concentration. Um, so it's slightly weirdly uh, set up here. So one is on the left and zero is on the right. So it's sort of it's kind of the wrong way around these axes. But it's as a function of depth, the concentration is is one, which is shown the wrong way around, but there it is, one there and zero in the interior. And on the bottom, I'm going to plot, evolving over time, what the convective flux, the, the flux through the top is for this system. So here it goes. You can see the fingers. These are dense fingers of, of whatever it is you're, you're trying to describe, which fall through the domain. And as they fall, they coarsen. There's all sorts of interesting dynamics going on here around the top. You see this these sort of hierarchy of small fingers washing into bigger ones and so on and so forth. It's all very interesting. There's lots and lots one can think about, but uh, I don't want to sort of highlight all the dynamics you can see, but the the, the domain, the main domain is dominated by these long, uh, wide fingers which sink. And it, and it, over time, you hit this regime that you can see now where the uh, the concentration in the interior, if you look on the right here, is, is roughly independent of depth, and it's just gradually decreasing. And at the same time, you can see the, sorry, my the, the bars are all appearing, but the flux, was initially going around some oscillating around some constant value and begins to decrease. And this is what I would call the shutdown regime, where convection is gradually becoming less strong because you've used up all the all the um, all the fluid in the domain. There's no there's no um, there's no uh, sort of spare fluid left. You've started to saturate the entire domain, and so the driving density difference between the top and the interior is becoming less and less over time, and will eventually go to zero, and the convection will just stop. In, in this situation, there's no there's no sort of regeneration of fluid in the in the porous medium. Let me just show you that again, so you've you've got the got the idea of how this thing evolves. So the the, the fingers fall at this point. The concentration is the flux is is oscillating around a roughly constant value, and there's this kind of wedge shape of of C bar, the horizontally average concentration. But at some point about here, you it, the whole thing it, it starts to realize that it's filling up the domain with with um, dense fluid. Uh, sorry, with yeah, with dense fluid, and so it, it, the the flux begins to decay, and and a key point for trying to come up with some average model is that in this regime, the interior concentration is is roughly independent of depth. The the, the implication of that is that there is some somehow it's able the the system is able to sort of reorganize itself, um, so that it the interior evolves in some kind of quasi static way, so the 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 concentration is spread throughout the interior in some in some effective manner by these long by these long fingers such that the the interior concentration uh is independent broadly of depth in this regime and this regime is therefore quite um amenable to trying to write down some sort of average model or what i've called a box model here so i'll just run through the basic idea here again i'm not going to dwell too much on the details but it's fairly simple if you're trying to model a situation as i've sketched here so this is just the same setup the key thing you might care about is um, so the concentration is one on the top, and it's let's let's say it's some value theta in the interior, which is a function of t, and that you kind of want to know what how does theta evolve. Uh, so at any point there is a driving density difference, delta rho as shown here between the c bar is one and the c bar is theta in the middle, which is going to get less over time. Uh, so that driving density difference is evolving. You can simply write down, by, I mean, you can integrate the transport equation if you want to, but this sort of must be true by just mass conservation considerations that the the evolution of this theta is driven by the flux through the top. So d theta dt is just f. It just is what the flux, the flux of concentration through the upper boundary. And f, if you uh, if you recall that the the only way that concentration can actually enter this domain is through uh, there's no flow through the top. So the only way concentration can get in is by diffusion. So actually at the top, that's kind of what this layer here is. There's a there's a thin diffusive boundary layer of some depth delta, which you don't know, where concentration is diffusing in and then and then convection is kind of scouring the, the boundary layer and holding it at some thin, thin depth and pulling the concentration into the domain into the Domain. So if you knew what delta is, then you know what the, the flux is, because of course it's a, it's um, 
it's diffusion. The flux is just the the delta C over delta Z, if you like. It's, it's so it's the change in concentration over the change in depth. So then you need to have some sort of closure law for what delta is, and this is where one can fall back on kind of classic classical studies of convection. If you know anything about um, uh, Malchus Howard marginal stability boundary layer arguments for regular convection, or the famous four thirds um, flux law for convection. Uh, the basic argument there is that um, the strength of convection is so that the flow that induced by convection is so rapid that you're able to um, that, that the diffusive boundary layer at the, at the edge is uh, it, it always it, keep, it keeps wanting to grow. Right, Diffusion keeps wanting to expand that boundary layer in depth. But it, every time it tries to grow, it's 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 held at some depth because if it grows deeper than that, the the convective flow outside basically um, pulls out the extra density from the layer and squashes it back to that depth. And the argument, the 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 hypothesis is that the the depth that it's able to be held at by this system is that is the depth that is marginally stable. If you do a stability analysis on the boundary layer and say, you know, what is uh, at what depth of boundary layer do I expect to see instabilities generated? That's that is the depth that it's able to be held at. And this is a, a kind of well established hypothesis. It's not a it's not a it's not a fact. It's a hypothesis. Um, but if you apply it to the case of a porous medium and you go through the various scalings, which I'm not going to do here, you, you you come up with this statement that, that the boundary layer should go like one over the local concentration difference across it. That's a that's specific to the porous medium case, but that's what you get uh, with a with a prefactor alpha, which is just some number. And in fact, you can you can determine what alpha is if you if you've already studied the the um, the kind of classic convection setup of a Rayleigh Bernard cell, or what I would call a two-sided convection setup, you can actually determine alpha independently. So in some sense, alpha looks like a free parameter. It's actually not really a free parameter here. So you can chuck that into the model, and this you, you end up with a simple evolution equation for theta here, given here. So this is just really mass conservation plus that convection closure law, which you can solve. This is pretty straightforward ODE to solve, and you can just write down what theta is, and therefore what the flux is uh, as a function of t. And it turns out that, that these, these simple laws are actually incredibly good. So here's some numerics of this homogeneous case. Uh, this is from quite a while ago now. Um, uh, you see that the interior concentration is increasing um, towards one, which is the value that was imposed on the upper boundary over time. And the flux, this is on a much longer time scale than the, the movie I just showed. You can see the initial bit there where it's oscillating around a constant, and then that's the shutdown regime. And when you put the theory on top, uh, it's it's perfect. So it, it looks very good. So it's, so this seems like a pretty good um, pretty good model for what's going on in the shutdown case. Okay, that's my kind of whistle stop over, overview of the homogeneous situation. The thing for the purposes of what I want to talk about here is is what happens if there are layers. So now suppose you have this medium which I'm showing here, where instead of just being uniform, it's actually got some depth. I'm now calling this L star. But there's a uniform sequence of layers. So every H star, which is just some some other length, there is a thin layer of some depth epsilon H times H star. And there's going to be a series of these layers, N of them. So little n is the number of layers that they fit into the domain. And they all have the same spacing H star. But otherwise, the problem is exactly as before. So now we seem to have a parameter H star, and we have a parameter N, and there's a parameter epsilon H. And I'm also going to claim, say that in each of these thin layers of depth epsilon h, there is a reduced permeability by a factor epsilon k. So the domain has some permeability k, the thin layers have a permeability that is a factor epsilon k smaller. So that's the that's the setup we're going to think about here. Again, you can scale the whole problem. Uh, and if you do it, you, you again find that you can, if you do it in the same way that we did before, the, the, the effective Rayleigh number of the problem, which is a sort of measure of how strong the convection is going to be, is, a, is effectively reparameterized as the distance to each of the layers. So it's like saying if the layers of uh, if, if this number is small, you don't expect convection to be very strong. If this number is big, you do expect it to be strong. For the purposes of making some progress, I'm going to assume that the layers are thin. And if you do that, you actually reduce the problem further. So so I'm going to assume that the each of the, the uh, low permeability layers is much, much thinner than the distance between them. If you do that, you can simply look at the vertical component of Darcy's law for one layer and kind of expand what it looks like to leading order in that thickness of the layer. And it, it basically boils down to what is the pressure jump across the layer. So dp dz, if you expand it out, it's just what is the difference in pressure from just above the thin layer to just below the thin layer. 
And so to leading order, what you actually end up by doing in, in this way is parameterizing what the velocity across the layer is in terms of the jumping pressure across the layer. Uh, and the only parameter that appears to leading order is the is a ratio of this. Um, so little k here is epsilon k times big K in the layers. So it's a ratio of the layer thickness to the layer um, permeability. So this this combination, which I'm calling an impedance, is really the only parameter that matters in this thin layer limit. So I don't have to consider independently epsilon h and epsilon k. I can just say omega is what I care about. Large values of omega mean that the layers are providing a, a large impedance to flow. They are they are effectively um, fairly impermeable. Small values of omega mean the layers are broadly not providing much resistance. It's it's really like a resistance if you think about if you're used to sort of electric electric currents or something. That's basically what this is. So now the problem is parameterized just by H, which is the distance to the layers, N, which is the number of layers, and omega, which is the impedance of the layers. OK, let me show you some some uh, some snapshots of what happens. So if omega is small, let's let's take the small omega case first here. Every I'm scaling Z by H. So every time there's a unit, one, two, et cetera, three, that, that's where there is a layer. And if omega is small enough, of course, the layers don't do anything. So here you see snapshots over time uh, showing the concentration with some streamlines and the layer. You can see no effect of the layers. The layers are just it, they're not really there. The whole system gradually shuts down once the stuff reaches the bottom and just like we saw before. So nothing interesting happens. If we go to a larger value of omega, uh, you see that now remember the layers are every time there's a unit here. So here at one, there's a layer. And you can see that the, there's some impact as these little plumes hit it. It's a bit like that movie I showed on the first slide, the the the, the dense stuff, rather than going straight across, it spreads out sideways uh, and then it pushes some fluid across. So you get this kind of um, these kind of structures which form here. They form at each layer. You can see by by down here, there's there's a lovely pattern of lots of them. And it clearly has some impact on the way that the, the large falling plumes sort of organize themselves. But broadly, the same kind of qualitative shutdown happens over time. If you go to a very large value of impedance, so now it's really difficult to get across the layers, you see that they have a big impact. So here they hit the first layer and they don't go across it. And in fact, they 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 really don't. Remember that the, the black lines here are streamlines. So what you find if you look at the streamlines carefully, you see that none of them are actually crossing the layer. So they hit it and they start to build up density above the layer. And actually they don't, um, no, no uh, there's no transport of, of material across the layer. It's only um, It's only diffusion. So there is some diffusion of the concentration across the layer, which starts to build up instabilities. You can see here just below the layer. So they then are able to then convect downwards as well. And there's more flow below the layer, but there's actually no black lines crossing the layer. And this goes on down here. You can see there's now a third situation that's so starting to leak. And you can see it's actually just starting to leak into the fourth one as well. So it gradually does this layer by layer until at some point, remarkably, you think this is going to just keep going forever. Suddenly the whole thing overturns in some sense and you get these big plumes that, that cut through the whole lot and there's all sorts of interesting instabilities going on here but now there is look the black lines really do cross the layers there's flow across these layers so this is a plume that's really crossing all of the layers whilst at the same time at each layer there is kind of instabilities forming and you can see over here there's a return plume going back up again so th this is what i'm calling a, a, an advexive reorganization so it seems to be settling into this system where it's just it's just layer by layer with diffusion between them. And then at some point it, it kind of overturns and you get this well, sort of semi overturns and you get this kind of reorganization of the flow. How does any of that reflect in uh, measurements of the flux? So here I'm showing the flux as a function of time. I'm showing the same data twice. So there's two plots of the same thing. One's just log scale and one is not log scale. Uh, there's, there's various lines here, so let me just talk you through it. If you look at the blue line first, that's the homogeneous case. So it, there's some initial transients, then there's this oscillating around a constant value, and then there's this shutdown that we've seen before. And as you go to the other colors, we're increasing the impedance. You see that the it basically leaves that initial curve, curve earlier. And, in, and for very large values of omega, say the brown curve, which is the brown one's this one down here, you see it actually leaves it right here which is actually where the fingers hit the first layer rather than where they hit the bottom of the domain where they hit the first layer and you start to decay but at some point the the, the thing then leaves this and that's the point of this advective reorganization so the orange one leaves there the, the the red one leaves there the brown one even the brown one you can see on the log scale leaves down here uh, and so that's when this thing undergoes this advective reorganization it's quite hard to it's quite hard to 
understand exactly what's going on with this advective reorganization. I've got a, a fairly bad movie here, which I hope gives you some idea of what's going on. It's very, very bad frame rate. So you, it's not a, it's not a good movie. It wasn't really made for public consumption, but I think it gives you the idea of what's going on. So, so the top is snapshots of the concentration. The bottom is a, is a picture of the flux with a little star where we are in time. You can ignore the other lines. Just look at the black one. So we're, we, we were initially oscillating around a constant value. We're now decaying. And we're, we're going to hit this advective reorganization region here. So I'll run this forward and see what happens. So here you can see it's just diffusing between each layer. There's no flow. And suddenly at this point, you see something happens. And you get these plumes starting to burst through. And there they go. You can see they, they start to sink right across it. And there's lots of other instabilities at each layer still. But now you've suddenly got this flow across all the layers. And it sets up this lovely kind of semi-regular pattern. Uh, with some number of plumes. I'll show that one more time. So initially you see here there are no no plumes crossing the layers and suddenly you see the dark blue regions start to burst through there in there and, and over here and, and at the same time lighter blue starts to burst down and you get these kind of large scale uh, reorganization happening. Okay. There is some modeling you can do of this problem. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I forgot to look when I actually started, but uh, I won't dwell on this too much because uh, we've seen it already. So in the low omega limit, it's actually very easy to write down what the model does. And in fact, I've just given you the answer that this is, it looks slightly different from what I showed for the homogeneous case, but it's actually exactly the same. It's just in my, in keeping track of the where I've changed the variable, changed the notation slightly. Um, so in the low omega case, you, you can just, it's just the homogeneous model and you can predict it and it looks very good. In the very high omega case where you say there is there is now no advection between the layers, it's just a series of diffusing of, of layers which are themselves convecting, but between each one there is some kind of diffusion. Then you'd expect that on average the profile looks something like this. So you've got this kind of diffusive layers at the top and bottom of each sort of section of layer, and then there's a roughly uniform interior concentration with some then flux driving, diffusive flux driving the concentration across into the next layer and so on and so forth. So you get this nested series of layers. And it's possible to write down simple models in the same way, just by conserving mass effectively, you can write down this and then you use the same kind of margin, marginal stability boundary layer um, uh, hypothesis to describe what the flux is between any two of the layers. And you can you can solve this problem. It's you know it's a, it's just a set of ODEs basically, and you can write down solutions. But you can also extract from the from the um, thing. You can extract some scalings, which is maybe what's more useful. You can find that, for example, the flux um, decays like t to the minus two thirds, as, whereas up here the flux decays like t to the minus two, which is a much stronger in the homogeneous case. And and actually, you've also seen that there's some there's a there's a change once this whole system reaches the base of the domain, if if it if it ever does. You get some slightly different scalings, but but the, the basically you can you can you can write down what these things do, and these models look very good if you ignore the advective reorganization. So here's the same flux plots. I'm showing a subset of the data I showed before, and you can see that so I'm showing the the low omega theory that's the homogeneous model, and the high omega theory that's the the layered the the, the layered with no advection across the layers model in red. And you see the two theories look very good for the respective values of omega. Low omega looks good for the black dashed line. Uh, high omega, that's the grey one, looks good for the red dashed line. Uh, and indeed, it looks good for the for the green line as well until the point where the green line leaves it, which is where the, the flow does some sort of advective reorganization. So you see that, that these two limits seem to be pretty good. Um, but there's still this curious advective reorganization feature. So let's just just briefly consider what is going on with that. If you remember the this limit we're working in is where the, the flow is driven across each low permeability layer just by this um, pressure jump across the layer, basically. Uh, that's 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 Darcy's law at each layer. Uh, so in other words, in order to generate flow across the layer in this high omega limit, so the layers have, have a high impedance, it's difficult to get across them. Uh, there is, uh, on the face of it, no flow across the layer, so it's just diffusion, so W is zero. The only way to get flow is to make a make this pressure jump big. So the way you the, the way you're going to get some advective reorganization is by maximizing this jump in pressure across the layers. And you see that what is actually happening is that the uh, over time the the upper layer the upper region the first layer below the below the upper boundary 
is getting more and more filled with dense material, right? So the, the density in inside this layer is getting higher and higher over time because more and more concentration is coming into the upper layer. Which means that the density difference between the material inside that layer and the ambient fluid way down here, which may or may not be, remember, you may have spread into multiple layers by now. So the it, it may be far below the ambient material, but still that that total density difference is increasing over time. Uh, and, and that allows for the, in principle, if you were able to sort of put those two materials next to each other, you could build up an, a, an increased hydrostatic pressure associated with the fact you're building up density in this upper layer. And that's basically the mechanism of this advective reorganization. You're able to build up enough pressure up here that the system is able to kind of bring up the, the fresh fluid from down here. And 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 and, um, and there's, en there's enough just buoyancy difference, enough hydrostatic pressure is able to be generated that drives flow then across the layer by by just build up of hydrostatic pressure in the upper layer. So that's that's the kind of mechanism. And in fact, once you've identified that, you can just sort of write down some scaling balances for when you think this should happen based on the relative size of a diffusive flux and this reorganization advective flux. And you can come up with some prediction which has a constant in it, which you which you don't know. But it turns out to be about one when you compare to the to the theory to the uh, numerical simulations. And this predicts also a time at which you think for a given omega when you think this should happen. And it turns out that according to this theory, this time scales well, it looks like this, so which scales like omega to three three halves if omega is large. And it turns out that this this quite simple argument is is a really good uh, predictor of the time at which this uh, advective reorganization happens. You see here's a plot of when it happens as a function of uh, omega for different values of n and h and such like, and it looks pretty good. And you can also extract from this, you know, when will there be no reorganization? Does, does it, is there? Does it always reorganize? Not necessarily, because the thing might reach the base of the domain before it actually is able to. And conversely, uh, it it might never reorganize because it never needs to, because actually omega is too small to have ever rented this kind of diffusive only regime. So you can get limits on on all the behavior just from thinking about what's going on here. This is just a, a sort of final series of pictures to to. Uh, for you to enjoy, really. Uh, <laughs> but it's kind of trying to demonstrate that the dynamics of what exactly is going on in this reorganization is quite complicated. So here's a series of different simulations. There are three simulations shown here at two different times. So uh, the three simulations are for, for sort of moderate omega, quite high omega, and very high omega over here. And they're showing a snapshot somewhere during the advective reorganization. So it's happening. And you can see that the system is kind of doing something. And then after, when the whole thing is definitely shutting down. And you can see this sort of rich dynamics going on here, but but something that's very noticeable is that the dominant length scale of the the, decay, the falling fingers is getting bigger with omega. So as omega gets bigger, these things are spreading out more and more, and that kind of is true uh, down here. And in fact, you also you yeah, it's hard to tell. Oh, no, I won't make that point. Yeah, that that's that's the key thing I want to say there. The other thing you can ask from the same model is, can you predict that that feature precise, that precise feature I just pointed out, you know, that there's a, there is a very clear dominant length scale in this problem, you know, that, that is growing with Omega. How do you predict that? What is setting that? Well, it's the same, according to the theory anyway, it's the same principle of this hydrostatic pressure builds up up here. That requires, uh, it's, it's like um, the only way to generate that hydrostatic pressure is to have a large enough um, sort of lateral pool that you can build up this this current that has this kind of slope that's able to then push fluid across. So that so if you need to build a bigger hydrostatic pressure, you're going to have to push to a wider sort of basin for each for each plume to provide that pressure drop. And that argument, again, you can just go through the scalings and it gives a prediction there in red. Looks like root omega h. And it, that actually also turns out to be pretty good. It's quite hard to these simulations are very um, expansive because there's very fine scales as well as much larger scales. So, there's some ambiguity for large uh, values of of lambda, but but that looks like a pretty good prediction too. Uh, so so it seems like you can you can sort of also understand that the, what's driving this length scale increasing enormously as omega gets bigger. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm basically done here. I just want to I'm not. This is a final slide really, which says uh, please don't try and understand the the the, the <laughs> look at all the scalings here because there's a whole load of them. Um, the point of showing this is simply to say that one can, having done all of the stuff I've just talked about, one can actually create these kind of phase diagrams. This is a, a, a diagram of, of omega against t, so time, and this is the impedance on the vertical axis. 
and you can ask at any point on this diagram what what regime is the flow in and what is the scale the relevant scaling for uh for the flux at that point and you can identify what all the scalings are and i've just i've written them all out but you can see that if omega is small enough the layers never do anything uh if omega is big then they do do something after some time uh and you can sort of say what's going on and you find that there's this reorganization region and actually if omega is too big then you never hit that reorganization region but if you're in the middle here then you will you'll initially go through this kind of impermeable region and then you'll reorganize and then be in this late time situation okay i'm going to stop there uh that summarizes everything i've said i i um if i've got time to show one slide more this one is actually ties back to the original application if you care about this in terms of some physical situation you can use these kind of models to learn kind of qualitative points so so this is completely an example it's not i've just in some sense i made up these numbers but i put them into the model and said suppose you have an aquifer where suppose the aquifer is 10 meters deep uh so it's, it's 10 meters from the top to the bottom and there are a series of low permeability layers which are one meter apart from each other and they are themselves only five centimeters thick so that's sort of plausible if you think of the first picture i showed you on of the uh, exposed cliff side you can work out what all of that means for various things i i mean uh, taking a a specific advection diffusion length scale that corresponds to a set of parameters which is a fairly high permeability but but plausible for sandstone um and you can just ask you know when for example when would you expect shutdown to begin in a in a, in a homogeneous medium after 15 years fine and then you could say what suppose if the low permeability layers uh, are three times less permeable they actually still have no impact on this, this situation but if they're 10 to the minus four times less permeable which is perfectly plausible permeability can vary by many orders of magnitude they have an enormous impact and you find that actually the um the domain is only reached at the bottom of the domain is only reached after five thousand years as opposed to 15 years uh, and the flux decays enormously and you can see that the size of the plumes that so the, the structures you would see if, if you if you sort of looked are completely different depending on these two situations so it clearly matters this kind of thing that can have a huge impact on on what you get okay I'll, I'll stop there thank you thank you uh duncan for this very nice talk i'm sure there will be questions so i just uh, leave it to the audience to ask questions yeah i do have a question hello so, yeah thank you so much for this uh, nice talk I wanted to just ask, while you are initializing your problem you know, for the layered ones, mm -hmm. how do you define, I mean, your pressure, uh, initialize your pressure or velocity? Good question. You mean numerically? Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, for step-like functions of this concentration, we take concentration gradient across uh -huh. this uh, length uh, j direction you can i mean how you are prescribing your pressure and velocity in the non-linear simulation yes for this one yeah so uh it's a good question i i, I appreciate it. i didn't talk at all about how i'm doing this numerically i just showed you the answer um the um so the key thing about this assumption this this limit that i'm working in this thin layer limit is that i'm not because I'm making this assumption, I'm not resolving the layers at all. So I, I actually do this. My code is a is a, a sort of finite difference. It's a mixed finite difference spectral code, but in the vertical, it's it's a finite difference code. So so effectively, what happens once you've made this thin layer approximation is that the the layer, which in principle has some finite width, you reduce to one grid point. And at that grid point, you say instead of actually trying to resolve anything about the layer, I'm simply going to impose this jump condition here on the pressure and more specifically i don't actually want to work in terms of pressure at all and, and so the, the code uh if you go back to the original equations the, the first thing i would do if i was solving this numerically is eliminate the pressure you can take the curl of darcy's law and that gets rid of the pressure as a variable altogether and if i take the horizontal derivative so the d by dx of this equation here that also gets rid of the pressure because dp dx is just proportional to the horizontal velocity so i can repose this as a jump condition in the horizontal velocity 
as something to do with the d by dx of the vertical velocity. And so that's what I actually impose strictly on a grid point, on a line of grid points at each layer. So I impose that there is this jump in u given by well, given by this equation. So I don't ever, I don't, so A, I don't ever actually solve for the pressure. I, I eliminate the pressure from the problem. And B, in this thin layer limit, I'm not actually resolving the layers, the thin layers at all. I'm simply imposing this jump condition at each layer. I did do it. Uh, you can check, you know, you might think that sounds dodgy. So I have also some simulations where I, I actually have a finite layer, which I have a load of grid points that go into it. And then and then I just need to make sure at the boundary of the layer, I've got the right uh, matching fluxes into the layer and out of the layer. So there's no jumps in this in this situation that there's, I'm actually resolving the layer and it it looks broadly the same. I mean, that you can show you can show that the error is what you think it should be according to this uh, error here and, and it works out. So this this is a pretty good. It's pretty nice. Numerically, it's a lot easier than trying to resolve the layers. You just you just parameterize it all by a jump. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm just afraid the call may drop because it was scheduled for certain duration and I tried to extend, but if it doesn't, then we can continue. If it does, then uh, I'm really sorry. Don't worry. Uh, okay, so if there is question, you can ask because I tried to extend and it should work. 